My name is Leo Trudeau, and I'm 52 years old. I have my own import-export company. I buy products from foreign countries to sell them here in the United States, and the other way around as well. Being a businessman is also an addiction, to me at least. So I also like to buy and sell used items on the internet, not under my company, but simply on my own, as Leo, the common individual. I have several ads running on different online platforms. At one occasion, I was contacted by someone who was interested in a video game console that I was selling on Craigslist. An Atari Jaguar, mid-90s, a little bit of an underground system. It's definitely a collector's item these days. I was selling the console with the original box, plus a few games included, which made the price tag go up to $450. So. I was happy to know that I was going to sell the Atari Jaguar. After exchanging a couple of emails with the person, Luke Lee, one phone call sealed the deal. I'm very excited about buying the Jaguar. From the pictures, I can say that it's in great condition and functioning properly as well, since you were kind enough to display footage of the system working. Being a retro video game collector, the fact that the full box is included makes a big difference, Luke said. Given the sound of his voice, it appeared that he was a young man no older than 25 years old, give or take. He was, in fact, very talkative, asking me about old video games in general, but also 80s and 90s pop culture. I found him to be nice and somehow amusing as an individual, but I just wanted to get the business closed. And so we decided to meet the next day. He gave me his address. Luke told me that he didn't drive. That being the case, it made sense that I was taking the console and the games to his house. It was still a relatively big package, too big and still valuable enough for someone to carry it on foot or through public transportation. Less than 24 hours later, around 6 p.m., I arrived at Luke's house. It was a nice place on the suburbs. I assumed that he still lived with his parents and that he probably didn't want them to know about their son spending almost $500 on a 90s video game console. Fine by me, I just wanted to get the money and make the kid happy with his Atari. As I parked the car, Luke immediately came out of his house, even before I called him. He was probably waiting at the window. He actually looked younger than 25 years old, but appearances can be misleading. Luke was wearing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle t-shirt, and he had short red hair and freckles. No signs of facial hair whatsoever, not even a shaved beard. He was wearing an enormous pair of glasses, He was smiling at me as if I was Santa Claus himself bringing a gift from his dreams. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. I'm glad you're here, he said as we shook hands. Uh, Hello, Luke. Ah, so here it is, the good old Jaguar. I bet most of your friends never played Doom on the Jaguar. For sure you'll impress them, I said, taking the package from my car's trunk. Uh, I don't really have friends, to be honest. Would you mind bringing the console into my house and helping me set it up? Luke asked. Uh, Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, No trouble at all. I replied, being sincere. Luke seemed to be happy with my answer. I followed him into the house. After getting in, I assumed Luke's parents were out on vacation because the house was a complete mess and smelled bad. Uh, I see you're home alone these days, Luke. But uh, really, if you don't mind taking my friendly advice from a grown-up, try to clean up every once in a while. You never know. Your parents may pop up by surprise. I said, trying to be nice and concerned even. Oh, don't mind about that, Mr. Trudeau. I live here alone. My parents died a few years ago. Boat accident. They were never really there for me, but had tons of money, which I inherited along with other things, like the house. I guess I should hire a housekeeper then. Uh, Thank you for the advice, Mr. Trudeau, Luke said with a childish smile on his lips, as we finally entered what I assume was his gaming room. I set up the Atari Jaguar for him. Within a few minutes, the console was ready to be played. Thank you so much, Mr. Trudeau. Uh, Here's the money. By the way, before you go, Won't you play with me for just five minutes or so? As I said, I don't really have any friends. No brothers or sisters or parents, Luke said. 
feeling sorry for the kid, I said, uh, sure, uh, but only for a few minutes. I, I gotta go. By the way, how old are you, Luke? I asked. I just turned 17, he answered. After 20 minutes, I decided it was time to go. I had done my good deed for the day. I was sad for the kid, but I wasn't his father. But the kid himself had a different idea. Luke insisted he wanted to walk me to my car. And when I shook his hand and said goodbye, Luke asked, Mr. Trudeau, will you be my adoptive father? You don't need to support me or anything. Just visit me once or twice every week. Maybe spend the weekend now and then. We could do things together. Go out for dinner, movies, play video games together. Didn't you enjoy spending the last hour with me? Okay, now I was getting freaked out. I could see Luke's green eyes behind his glasses looking at me with expectation. Listen, Luke, I think you should go and talk to someone. Therapy, maybe. For sure, in school, someone can help you. I wish you all the best, but I'm not your father, kid. And you're 17 years old already. You'll be a grown-up man soon enough. It's time to grow up. But it's hard. But it'll be worth it. Take care. I said to Luke before driving back to my place. That same night, I woke up. My cell phone was ringing. It was Luke. The young man was clearly drunk or high and crying. He was begging me to become his adoptive father. My wife, Janice, was sleeping next to me, and she also woke up with Luke's sobbing screams. I terminated the phone call and explained to Janice what was happening. Unbelievable. You never know what kind of prank life is preparing, Janice said. I had to agree with her. Luke insisted and continued to harass me for the next few days. He even started calling me dad. Alarmed, I was forced to call the authorities and get a lawyer. For now, this seems to have worked, but the situation is still very disturbing to me. I hope Luke leaves both me and my wife alone and gets the help he needs. I was only 18 when it happened. My dad had just broken his arm, and as a construction worker, this put him out of work for a strenuous few months. My mom was just a bartender. She made close to nothing, and even with the mountain of shifts she took on in order to make up the difference, it never helped. By the time we were verging on poverty, I stepped up to the challenge of keeping our family out of the deathly hands of starvation. That was the day I created an account on Craigslist. I'd heard from a couple of friends that the site brought about great work opportunities and would provide me a chance to connect with those employers who were looking for some youthful labor, such as myself. After scanning over a couple ads, some entailing work that needed degrees, others just needed you to be 18 and fit enough to carry heavy objects. But then one ad caught my eye. Farm work, $20 an hour, Ohio, preferred age 18. My eyes lit up at the final part, detailing this was a job I could do. I lived in a nearby state, I would rather not disclose due to personal privacy, but the drive was just long enough so I could afford a coach there. The money I made would be plenty to send home, and I could easily live off a mere $10 a day by eating food from the farm, hopefully without whoever was employing me noticing. I showed the listing to my parents and they were beyond thrilled. Look, Mom, this job could save us, I shouted to her in joy. Oh, Max, I'm so proud of you. We'll get you all packed up, and me and your dad will walk you to the bus station tomorrow. We hugged before going to tell Dad, and his reaction was equally as filled with hope. He sprang off the sofa in joy and exclaimed, Well done, Max. You'll only be there a couple months, I promise, and then I'll be straight back to work and you'll be able to come home. The three of us then got to work packing, checking I had enough clothes, money, food, and water to get there since the journey was a harsh 10-hour drive overnight. We spent the rest of the night talking. Finally, it seemed our family had regained its vitality we had once possessed before Dad's arm broke. 
We fell asleep on the sofa all together, watching a movie to drift us all to sleep. If I'd only stayed. If I only knew what was to come, I would never have left. The next morning came about, and I grabbed my luggage as we all headed out the door down the road to the bus station. Before entering the bus, I gave my parents one last goodbye hug and stepped onto the bus, waving to them as I departed for the farm. The journey was a long one. Hours upon hours of non-stop empty scenery passed us the further along we got. Two other young-looking people were also on the bus. Were they going to the farm as well? Eventually, the ten hours came to an end, and we clampered off the bus and watched as it parked up at the station, waiting for the next departure around 10 p.m. later that same evening. One of the boys walked in the opposite direction to the farm, whilst me and the girl stayed. You here for the farm job, too? She asked in a plain-sounding Texan accent. The girl stood opposite to me, holding a small bag and a map, slightly dusted with time, but still holding itself together. Her hair was long and black, and she wore jeans and a polka-dotted red and white t-shirt. She was quite attractive. Yeah, job looked as if it paid well, and my parents needed the money. I'm Max. She nodded and returned with, I'm Clarissa. Nice to meet you. She grabbed my hand to shake it. Surprisingly, she felt cold to the touch. Quite a shock in the boiling heat of the Ohio sun. After we exchanged names and greetings, we began to make our way up the road towards this massive red barn house. It stood at least 30 feet tall, and you couldn't even fit it all in your vision. It was nearing 9 p.m., so we knocked. And there, opening the door, exposed a man of around 6 feet in height dressed in clad black. You kids here for the farm work? He said in a grumbled tone, expressing a deep-rooted hatred for youth just by the sound of his voice. Um, yes. Yes, sir. I wanted to make a good first impression so I could get a pay raise as soon as possible. Follow me. This time his voice sounded more serious. Angered, almost, but we followed regardless. The barn was pitch black. He flicked on a torch to see our way through the void of darkness, leading us to the other end of the barn. I looked at Clarissa with a rather nervous look. She ignored it as we approached the back end. Suddenly, the flashlight switched off. Rather bewildered, we called out, Hello? Sir? No reply came. Until all of a sudden, the entire barn lit up with a great blazing light. It scorched our retinas as we covered our eyes. But as they slowly regained focus and adjusted to the light, hanging off the beams above were countless human corpses all seeming to range between the ages of 16 and 17. They all had colossal pieces of flesh lost from their bodies. That's when the booming echo of a shotgun blasted Clarissa directly in the face. Her body thumped to the floor. Her head looked like a newly blossomed flower with pieces of her skull lying about her on the floor. I slowly arched my head upwards only to see the man who opened the door pointing the shotgun towards me. I reacted instantly, and as he clicked the trigger, I moved just enough to have the shotgun take off my entire arm, nearly losing the upper half of my torso instead. The pain was inexplicable, but the adrenaline it gave me allowed me to sprint back out of the barn, with a frustrated shouting coming from behind me as I fled. Get back here, you rat! I want to add you to my collection of vermin! A second blast came, but luckily it missed and hit the door beside me as I flung myself out of the barn. In moments, I'd made it to the station, clambering onto the bus, screaming for the driver to call the police. Just in time, too, the man had followed. But with so many people around, he could do nothing but attempt to flee towards the barn before the police arrived. They came around 30 minutes later, and the sheriffs and the deputies raced up the road towards the barn. Gunfire echoed throughout the town until eventually the ambulances arrived. The sound of wailing sirens drowned out my screams as they hastily wrapped up my arm and applied buckets worth of antiseptics to try and clean the wound. My arm was gone, but my life was saved. I went home that night. Once in my hometown, I was taken straight to a hospital. A few days later, I woke up from my pathetic state both physically as well as mentally. 
My parents were there beside me, bawling their eyes out. They told me that wretched man had been shot dead upon police arrival at the barn. He'd been using that ad for over a year, drawing in gullible, desperate, and young people like myself in to then shoot them, perhaps aiming to fulfill some psychotic need in his head for blood. But since I escaped, he was put down, never to kill anyone again. And as I lay here in bed now, looking at my lost limb, I think to myself, the world is cruel, but people are crueler. My name is Gwen, and I'm 25 years old. I work as an office secretary, which is enough for me to make a decent living, but my dream was always to become a professional singer. Yes, I know, the cliché. Nevertheless, music was always my passion. I don't just sing in the shower. I have performed live, singing with a few bands in local music festivals. Nothing too serious, including the symbolic paychecks, but it was enough for me to know that I had something going on. I also started posting songs and videos of me singing on social media, and the feedback was decent enough, and the viewers were slowly climbing with each post. But I needed to improve the quality of my videos, so I decided that I needed a better microphone. I wanted the best that money could buy, and so, knowing that the microphone was easy to keep, I decided to try and find a used one on Craigslist. There were a decent amount of options, and after a careful search, I found a model that was great, and the price was very appealing too. I contacted the seller. He was very nice and we arranged a meeting for the next day in the parking lot of a place right down the road. I will be wearing a Nirvana t-shirt and blue jeans. I am tall and have short blonde hair. Of course, I will be out of my car holding the package and the microphone. You can't miss me. My name is Bart, by the way. He said, Okay, I'll meet you there. My name is Gwen. Um, how about 6 p.m.? Is that fine for you? I asked. Yeah, six is good. I'll see you by tomorrow. Bye. Bart confirmed. The next day, when I arrived, ten minutes after six, I immediately saw Bart. Fitting his own description, I waved and walked towards him. He smiled and started to take the microphone from the box to show me. And I assumed I thought that this was a good sign. Hey, Gwen. Uh, so here it is, as you can see. I still have the original box, and the microphone is in perfect condition, I can assure you, Bart said. The microphone really seemed to be well taken care of. You never know before you test it, but I decided to take Bart's word on it. Thanks. Uh, here's the money. I'll see you around, Bart, I said, trying to look cool. He was ten years older than me, had tattoos, and I assume he had experience in the music business. As a confirmation before I departed, he asked, Are you a singer? I recently started a new band with young musicians that are taking their first steps, and we talked about trying to work with a female vocalist. We're just exchanging different ideas for now and playing some covers. Pop and rock that everyone knows from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, Bart said. Well, I'm an amateur singer, yeah. Um, I do have a bit of experience performing live, and I also have songs of mine and covers uploaded on the internet, I replied. Good. Uh, well, if you want to try out and come to rehearsal, you already have my number. This is the studio where our rehearsals are taking place, Bart said, as he gave me his card from that of a music studio. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. I'll think about it, and I'll give you a call if I'm interested, I said. Sure. Enjoy the microphone, Bart replied before getting back into his car and driving away. I returned home by foot, anxious to try out my new, used, microphone. It was working perfectly. I spent a couple of hours recording vocals. Happy with the results, this also gave me the adrenaline rush to accept Bart's proposal, to be a part of his band. I thought that the fact that it was a starting project, that this meant that I could influence the band's sound and even bring in a couple of original songs that I started composing my own. The next day, I called Bart and said I would be happy to join his band. 
That's great news, Gwen. Our rehearsal will be tomorrow at nine. Are you available? Bart asked. Yeah, I am. Uh, that's a good hour. I'll be there. I still have the card from the studio with the address, I replied. Excellent. We'll see you tomorrow. And so we did. That Thursday night, I was there, at the noisy, silent studios, rehearsing with my new band. Douglas was playing the bass, Monica on the drums, and Bart himself was playing the guitar. The rehearsal was going great. I thought we were sounding good for musicians who were just taking their first steps playing together. We fooled around by jamming some hits, from Michael Jackson to Audio Slave. Then, when we were finally done for the night, around 11.30, Bart started to pass a and Douglas had brought a few beers. I'm usually not much of a drinker, and even less of a smoker, but I had tried them before, and I was excited to do it with my new band, and hopefully new friends, so I couldn't say no. We were all just sitting on the floor inside the rehearsal room chatting, smoking and drinking, but after a few moments, I started to feel dizzy, which was strange because the stuff didn't seem to be strong. Although the beer did have a funny taste, but I thought it was just the brand, a kind that I'd never tried before. I noticed that Monica seemed to be falling asleep as well. Suddenly, I passed out. When I woke up, I saw the nightmare that was awaiting me. Bart was sitting very close to me, his one hand inside my top, and my bra was unhooked. He seemed to be surprised to see my eyes looking at him. I was disgusted, scared, and angry, all at the same time. Taking advantage of Bart's surprise, I managed to push him aside. We were still inside the rehearsal room. I stood up, still in shock and dazed. I was able to see that Douglas was doing the same thing to Monica. He started to look at me, his eyes wide open and saliva dropping from his dirty mouth. Sadly, Monica was still knocked out and wasn't aware of what was happening to her. As I bolted out, fortunately there was a police car parked nearby the studio. I alerted them. Both Bart and Douglas were arrested. It didn't take long for them to confess, knowing they had no other way out. Their plan was to drug me and Monica, not with the joint, but by putting acid in our beers. Me and Monica were never supposed to know about the ordeal. Fortunately for me, my beer wasn't contaminated enough, and so I was able to wake up from that living nightmare. Me and Monica became friends and are supporting each other in order to be able to deal with the trauma that we went through. We are actually making music together, but we only play with other women now. I smashed a microphone that I bought from Bart and got another one, this time brand new. As for Bart and Douglas, they got off easy. I'm sure it wasn't the first time they did such a crappy thing. They must have been serial offenders. Perhaps our country needs stricter laws for crimes against women. My Aunt Molly lived in one of the most expensive apartments in town. It was large, with four floors and two apartments on every floor. My aunt didn't live in the penthouse, but the apartment she lived in on the third floor was enough compensation. One summer, when my parents were traveling to see my grandparents, they agreed to let my younger sister, Vivian, and I spend the weekend with her. We were used to staying home whenever they had to go on trips like that, but it seemed like everyone was willing to leave the house empty for a while. Friday morning, my parents traveled. I dropped my sister off at school and went to mine. In the afternoon when school was over, I branched to my sister's school and picked her up. That wasn't a new routine. I've been my sister's chauffeur ever since I got my car when I was 16 and she was 10. The new trail to my routine was the journey we made to my aunt's house. She had registered with the securities beforehand. Those were one of the things that excited myself and Vivian. The house's tight security, the celebrity-like treatment, it was even better than an A-list actor occupying the penthouse. We were allowed into the house with no hassle. Aunt Molly dropped by my school earlier that day to give me the access card to her apartment. She worked in the entertainment industry, 
and she was never back home until late in the evening, sometimes at nighttime. But she promised to be back home early that day. She only knew it wouldn't be soon enough to welcome us from school. Vivian and I didn't mind. We relaxed and were comfortable in no time after we checked into the house and ate lunch. An hour later, we received a call from Aunt Molly. Are you at home now? She asked. Yes, I replied. I told her about how comfortable her house was. I thanked her for her snacks and juice she left for us and also asked when she would be coming home or if she was done with work. She confirmed that she was done and on her way to the mall to get some supplies and some groceries that we would certainly need. A quick remembrance of the things in her refrigerator made me wonder what other things we needed, but I didn't ask. I was about to tell her to hurry back when an emergency light flickered and an emergency alarm didn't stop ringing in the room. Aunt Molly must have heard the sound too because she asked what was wrong, and before I could answer, a loud and clear announcement was made from the security office. An intruder is lurking somewhere in the apartment. You are now under lockdown. My heart dropped and adrenaline rushed through me. I could see it through my skin. The call with Aunt Molly ended abruptly. My sister stared at me, her eyes heavy with fear and trepidation. I didn't know what to say or do. I was as scared as she was. She rushed towards the door. Lock all the windows and every other door. I barked at her, and the two of us scrambled through the apartment, locking every door and window, checking, then double checking. Another 10 minutes later, my phone vibrated, and I realized that it was a call from Aunt Molly. She asked to speak with Vivian first. I handed over the phone to Vivian and watched as fear dissipated from her eyes. Whatever Aunt Molly was telling her, it was working. It isn't long before she gave the phone back to me. Joan, I need you to be brave. It's the first thing Aunt Molly says when she was sure the phone was in my possession. She went on to narrate how the cops were on the trail of a serial <laughs> Luck collided with them that afternoon, and they caught on with the but just before they could apprehend him, he ran into the apartment and they had to lock down the entire apartment to catch him. It was a scary thing to hear. She told me to lock the doors and stay safe in the house. The cops would swing by soon and check, but we shouldn't be scared. I nodded, forgetting that she couldn't see me. The call ended while after she told me to make a call if I noticed anything wrong. I held my sister's hand and was leading her into one of the rooms when I heard the sound of ruffling feet. I didn't allow myself to believe that one thought that traveled into my mind. It couldn't be the serial <laughs> had found his way into my aunt's apartment. I stopped in my tracks and gripped my sister's hand with more energy. She would have winced if I didn't cover her mouth so quickly and listen to the silence. The man must have caught on to our presence because the atmosphere remained still. I bent over to look at my sister. The fear that was gone a while was back and worse. I trembled and my breathing became heavier. I thought hard about what to do in seconds. The door to a room creaked and I knew the man was checking to see who had discovered his presence. My thumping heart was racing. My hand shook and I could barely make a call. Vivian, or so I thought, yanked it off as I tried to steady it in my hands. I looked up to see the coldest eyes I had ever seen in my life. In his hands was my little sister crying. He gripped me too and covered my mouth before I could even scream. He dragged us towards one of the rooms and I was sure that was the end of us. His breath smelt like weed and alcohol. His hands were rough, and I couldn't help but think of what would happen next. After a while, he tied me to one side of the bed and covered my eyes with a blindfold. I didn't know what he had done to my sister, but I heard her wince and cry. Hot tears filled my eyes at the sound of the agony in her voice. I prayed hard that someone would discover us or figure out that the criminal wasn't in the other places because he was here, 
in my Aunt Molly's apartment. They did discover us, but by that time, half of my clothes were gone from my body. But I was safe. Luckily, the creep couldn't harm my sister as well. The criminal was arrested. Mom never let me visit Aunt Molly in the apartment ever again. They came back from their trip that day and took us back home. My sister still suffers from the trauma, but I believe in time. She'll be okay. I mean, something worse could have happened, and I just hope to never be trapped in another lockdown again. My name is Adrian, and I study medicine in university. Last year, we experienced a chaotic and unexpected episode. As I was having one of my classes, someone from the university staff came in and warned us that a massive shooting was taking place outside. The reasons were still unknown. Nevertheless, as long as the police didn't solve the situation, and hence, before it was completely safe for us to leave, the university was closed. No one could come in or leave. It was a dark, late afternoon in early December. It was also raining. This made things more difficult for the authorities when trying to catch the bad guys. And to finally consider that everything was back to normal. As normal as it gets in an American big city. So I figured we were about to spend a generous amount of hours locked in our own university. Now at first, almost everyone was alarmed. We could actually listen to the shooting spreading from the exterior. They were coming from different areas, some closer than others. I was more excited and curious than scared, to be honest. All the doors were now shut, and the university became our bunker. Teachers and students on the same boat, discussing what was happening inside classrooms, laboratories, corridors, and, of course, the cafeteria. The nocturnal hours arrived soon enough, as it was December. I was sitting on some stairs with my best friend Celia, in a quiet area close to the university's attic. No one ever went there. The building, although refurbished, was originally quite old. Several sections were added throughout the decades. Imagine a Lego construction in which you start with a small model, but are allowed to build more and more. That's pretty much what happened. Well, different kind of day and night. There'll be an interesting story to tell throughout the rest of our lives, I said to Celia as I lit a cigarette. You're not allowed to smoke inside, Adrian, Celia said. I think we were best friends because we complimented each other. She was always so nervous, and I the opposite. I think no one cares. Most students and teachers are on the lower levels of the building. It's fine. Just relax, Celia. Maybe we'll be interviewed when we get out. That would be cool, I said. What do you think's happening? Gang activity? Terrorist attacks? Celia asked. Those are two possible hypotheses, definitely. These days, guess you never know. Even someone who lost his job or his wife and wants to take revenge upon the civilized world. A well-trained individual with a couple of guns can produce a lot of damage. Want to smoke? I said. No, I'm fine, Celia replied. Both of us had already spoken to our families through our cell phones. Sometimes these things do become helpful, I have to admit. After a while, I got bored and asked Celia if she wanted to explore the attic. That's probably full of rats, Adrian. I hope not. With the amount of money my parents pay to keep me studying here. Come on, it'll be fun, I insisted. Uh, okay, okay, Celia finally agreed. I was always able to convince Celia to do the fun stuff with me. Deep inside, I thought she loved that side of me. We went upstairs and tried to open the massive door. With no surprise, it was closed. Fortunately for me, and due to my adventurous personality, one of my ex-boyfriends was kind of a bad boy, so he taught me how to open locks with simple items, such as paper clips, for example. As students, we have tons of those things with us. It took me a few minutes, but I managed to open the door. The room was actually enormous, like a hall. I tried to switch on the lights, but they weren't working. Once again, the cell phones were useful for that. 
Inside, there were lots of books, and also old laboratory devices, as well as old hospital beds. Not uncommon in a medicine faculty. There were also many boxes, of course. Both me and Celia were now opening those boxes, just for the sake of it. It was fun. I felt like I was opening a forbidden surprise Christmas gift. The smaller boxes only had more books, and even some sports-related objects, like a football, for example. I saw a couple of uniforms, which were once part of the university soccer team. From the time in which there were sorts of championships between different institutions of the same kind. But there was a big box, horizontal, placed on the very end of the attic, hidden behind broomsticks and buckets, and under a dirty gray blanket that captured my attention. Hey Celia, there's one box left. Maybe we'll find some treasure here. Sure is huge in comparison with the others, I said, approaching the box. Sure. It's shaped like a coffin, Celia answered. Celia, always so morbid. I love it, I replied. When I opened that box, I realized Celia was right. Inside, there were two skeletons. One of a grown-up, the other belonging to a child. Now, in theory, this could also be normal in a medicine faculty, but the skeletons had clothes. Celia almost screamed, but I managed to stop her. Quiet, Celia! Who could these people be? Or, or better said, who were they? We must report this, Adrian! And for once I agreed with my friend. But still, my sixth sense advised me in doing things my way. We will report this, yes. But to the police, not to anyone from the university, alright? Of course, it's good enough for me. This is creepy. Indeed it was. The next morning, the police finally released us from our own protective lockdown. And I informed the authorities about the skeletons in the attic. Later on, one of our teachers, Dr. Crane, was arrested. The skeletons belonged to his dead wife and daughter. Dr. Crane was the one who murdered them. Having the keys and access to pretty much all the rooms in the university, after poisoning his wife and daughter, a very clean way to commit murder, he took them there, and during the night, their corpses already placed inside that big box. The reasons behind the murder were not clear, but sometimes brilliant minds just crack and primal killing instincts take place. Dr. Crane's field of study was precisely the brain, and it had been the perfect crime. But Dr. Crane was very unlucky. If those shootings didn't happen, he would probably never have been caught. As for the shootings themselves, they were just a bunch of drunk junkies who were out for adventure and easy money, of course. One of them was shot dead, and the others were captured throughout the night. No civilian casualties. A couple of police officers were shot, but they were taken to the hospital and recovered. I like to think that Dr. Crane is sharing a cell with the shooter from that night who was caught. Love to see the look on the good doctor's face when knowing that his cellmate was indirectly the reason for his arrest. The idea of cooking never sounded good to me, even as a female living alone. I used to eat from my mom's table before I moved out, and never thought I'd have to fend for myself in school, but that was my reality, and it wasn't going to change anytime soon. Although I had secondary problems, the primary one became what to eat and where to get it. So I often patronized online food vendors, which cost me a lot, but were the only way out of hunger that I knew. Earlier in the morning of my 18th birthday, I had organized a party in my house after school, and my clique of friends had advised me to cook something, contradictory to my plan of just getting alcohol and snacks for the night. Unfortunately, they weren't around to help me cook something, so I was only able to contact Marie, who promised to be there earlier to help cook. Marie had no idea I didn't know the first thing about cooking, so I had it all planned out to cut myself on my thumb before the evening to escape doing any work. I joined her at school as early as possible to discuss how the plan would be, but she was too busy to say much and pleaded that we postpone the conversation till later that day. I spent major hours of the day bothering and scheming on how I wouldn't have to do anything but celebrate my birthday. Moreover, 
I had a plan B to order from the regular store where I got my food if things didn't work out with Marie. But it was just a plan B, so I didn't put any effort into checking if it would be available. Casey! I heard someone call behind me as I walked down the hallway to the cafeteria. I turned around to see Jessica, an acquaintance I'd made last semester, but had somehow made her way into my contact list and often dropped by at my house. I guess she knew my secret because she never saw me cook, and always commended my cooking, which I accepted without any explanation of how bad a cook I was. Jessica. I waved at her as she joined me, and we walked the remaining turns to the cafeteria. Happy birthday! She cheered me on as she opened her arms for a hug, keeping me in her warm embrace, which smelled like donuts and butter. Thank you, Jess. I answered as she opened her arms and held my hand, and we took our first turn towards the cafeteria. I heard there'd be a party at your house tonight, she inquired, and I suddenly remembered I had forgotten to tell Jessica because of her absence from school on the school's political duty with other schools in neighboring cities. Yeah, just friends, but you come over, of course, I urged on. Oh, great. It would have been sad if you didn't invite me, she chided. I'm sorry I didn't tell you earlier, I forgot. And since you're here now, there's no reason to not want you there. We cackled and bumped each other with our shoulders. Have you heard about David's mom's culinary school? She began. And I suddenly remembered the real reason why I never trusted nor felt the vigor to inform her of my birthday party. She loved gossiping and was unrepentant about it. I haven't. You should, since you're a great chef yourself and should be on par with her. Jessica jeered. I've eaten her food and yours, and the difference is clear. Oh, really? I raised a brow, feeling disgusted, but trapped in her enthusiastic voice on how good I was. Of course. And the truth is, it's one of the many reasons I'm so hyped about your birthday. Jessica blushed. I can't stop thinking of it. And whenever I try, the sweet savor of whatever you're going to cook threatens my taste bud. That's enough poetry, I cackled, beginning to fear the reality of the situation. There would be food, I affirmed with a shaky voice, hoping she would just quit the food talk and talk about something else. Even football. I'd be more interested in that than cooking. I'm glad to have known you, Cass, as she would often call to me. I'd come hungry as well, she finished, and completely cracked me up as we walked into the almost filled up cafeteria. I was doomed to have to eat with her, when I suddenly spotted Marie and my other friends sitting around with a space reserved for me. Excuse me, I said, and left her without hearing a reply to join Marie and my other friends. Cassie! They called out as I approached them with my food at hand and joined them at the table. Before I was able to sit down, they began singing a birthday song that suddenly echoed around the cafeteria. At this point, my fear intensified. Because the more people knew about my birthday, the more people at my house. Which means cooking is now a priority. I went home hurriedly after school to get ready for the party later that night. And when everything was set, I called Marie. But mysteriously, her phone wasn't going through. I kept calling with beads of sweat forming all over my body. I quickly hopped on plan B and called my food fender to deliver 50 packs of different foods in their store but I realized the world was against me when they hung up on me, claiming they were too busy. I sat depressed and sad. While I scrolled through my phone thinking of who to call next, I came across a food delivery app that I had downloaded months ago. And since it was an apartment and they had a package plan ready for 50 people in their plan, I made an order and it arrived promptly. My secret was saved by this food app. And there was no way I could show enough gratitude as I separated it into dishes and friends started trooping in for the long-awaited party of the month. An hour into the party, everyone was merry and the food had been set, so everyone joined in and quickly dug into the food from the serve-yourself tray. It was all going so well. till I suddenly heard about someone slumping in the toilet while defecating. We quickly rushed him out to an ambulance waiting and returned to the party, though everyone was worried about him. We had barely spent 10 minutes after the ambulance left when people began slumping and fainting without anyone to help. Within 30 minutes, everyone was on the floor looking sick and lifeless. Like someone was watching. Before I could call the police, 
they had arrived and arrested me. I learned from the prison that over 20 people died of food poisoning on that day, and many had serious injuries in their lungs and liver. In conclusion, only Jessica, Marie, and I survived the food poisoning, and both of them were at the party, but I didn't see them. What's more, an investigation found that the food app I'd ordered from never existed. <laughs> 